I am pleased to introduce Dr. Camille Petri, a young and dynamic new Harvard Medical School faculty member who works in the pulmonary and critical care division at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Boston. She will be discussing the management of COVID-19 associated ARDS in the ICU. The opinions she will be sharing are her own and may not reflect those of Harvard Medical School or the BI Deaconess Medical Center. Dr. Petri, welcome. Thank you, Dr. Southwick. It's a pleasure to be here and to speak with you about this really important set of topics. So the title of my talk today is COVID-19 patients in the intensive care unit and with a focus on ARDS and high quality ICU care. The major reason patients with COVID-19 will require ICU level care is due to respiratory failure, most commonly from hypoxemia. Though not all hypoxemia in COVID-19 is due to the acute respiratory distress syndrome, this is the feared complication of a COVID-19 infection. And so for this reason, we will focus on ARDS and we will also focus on some important high quality ICU care measures that you can employ in your intensive care unit. So let's remind ourselves of our case from before. Our patient is a 50 year old female who is a respiratory therapist. She has a SARS-CoV-2 infection and she initially presented with dyspnea, hypoxemia, and increased work of breathing and eventually developed progressive hypoxemic respiratory failure that required endotracheal intubation. She arrives in your intensive care unit how should you manage her respiratory failure? So the, in our next two videos, we will discuss how to recognize ARDS, the essential components of ARDS care, including low tidal volume ventilation, setting PEEP, fluid management, and prone positioning, elements of high quality ICU care, and finally, some changes to ICU care that you should think about during COVID-19. So the first question to ask yourself when our patient arrives is, does this patient have ARDS? Because if she does, this substantially impacts your management plan. ARDS is defined by the Berlin criteria. And the definition has evolved over the years, but the most recent version is from 2012. And the key criteria for the clinical diagnosis of ARDS are as follows. Firstly, impaired oxygenation as defined by a PaO2 divided by the FiO2 that's less than 300 while the patient is receiving at least five centimeters of water of positive airway pressure. Based on this ratio, patients can be divided into mild, moderate, or severe ARDS, which has implications both for mortality predictions and for management. Should we say a word about the estimates of FiO2? Estimates of FiO2 from non-PEEP delivering devices such as nasal cannula or a non-rebreather mask are completely inaccurate and should not be used to calculate a P to F ratio. The question about why should we use PEEP before diagnosing ARDS, the answer to that is that while the patient is receiving PEEP, this guards against shunt from atelectasis as the primary cause of hypoxemia. Uh, and also these PEEP delivering devices have much more reliable FiO2 uh, determinations. The second criteria is the need for bilateral opacities on chest imaging. And these need to be consistent with pulmonary edema, but not fully explained by effusions, atelectasis, nodules, or masses. Interestingly, the imaging for ARDS can be very heterogeneous. And classically, many of us were taught to look for the presence of bilateral fluffy opacities. But given the predominance of CT imaging these days, we now know that the lungs of patients with ARDS can look very different and don't need to meet this description. The onset of respiratory systems need, symptoms need to be within one week of a known insult or risk factor for ARDS. And finally, the fourth criteria is that the respiratory failure is not fully explained by heart failure or hypervolemia. This doesn't mean that patients cannot have ARDS and heart failure concurrently. In fact, many patients have some degree of cardiac dysfunction during critical illness. Furthermore, patients with ARDS do have some degree of pulmonary edema due to alveolar damage at the capillary interface. The key here is that the clinician just needs to be certain that hydrostatic or cardiogenic pulmonary edema is not the primary cause of the parenchymal infiltrates. So if we return to our patient, here we have her 
chest X-ray that shows bilateral interstitial infiltrates. There's no evidence of effusions or nodules or masses. We have her ABG data here where you can see that her PaO2 on an FiO2 of 1.0 gives her a ratio of 164. So she has moderate ARDS by these criteria. And finally, an echocardiogram reveals no significant cardiac abnormalities. And a bedside exam shows no evidence of hyperbolemia. So does our patient have ARDS? In short, yes. She has impaired oxygenation. She has bilateral opacities. She has a known insult, namely her SARS-CoV-2 infection. And finally, she has no available uh, information to suggest hypervolemia or heart failure as the cause of her parenchymal infiltrates or respiratory failure. There are a few other clues to ARDS. Patients with ARDS are often characterized by having a low respiratory system compliance. And that means that the lungs are very stiff and they require high pressures to take even very small breaths. Patients with ARDS typically do not have a substantial impairment in the airways resistance unless there's an underlying condition such as asthma or COPD, which is contributing. The compliance and the resistance of the respiratory system can be measured using the ventilator. But it's important to note that patients do not have to have low compliance to have ARDS, meaning this isn't a part of the Berlin criteria. So far in the COVID-19 pandemic, it does not appear that patients with ARDS from COVID-19 display a respiratory physiology that's unique to this infection. And in fact, many behave like prior cohorts of patients with ARDS from other causes. And so for this reason, evidence-based ARDS care has been the mainstay of management. So let's talk about some management strategies for ARDS. The following therapies are often used. So we start with low tidal volume ventilation, PEEP titration, deliberate fluid management, prone positioning, paralysis, pulmonary vasodilators, and finally extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. If I were on a desert island and I had to pick which ARDS management strategies to bring with me, I would bring the first four low tidal volume ventilation, PEEP, careful fluid management, and prone positioning. These choices are based on the evidence that supports these therapies, as well as the physiologic rationale for each. So let's explore these further. Starting with low tidal volume ventilation. This is defined as delivering tidal volumes as set on a mechanical ventilator between four and eight cc's per kilogram of a patient's predicted body weight. The predicted body weight is obtained by measuring the patient's height and then using a standardized conversion chart. Actual body weight should not be used. Delivering lower tidal volumes to stiff lungs protects the lungs from complications from mechanical ventilation, such as volume trauma or barotrauma, which is increased injuries due to high volumes or high pressures. And there's actually a mortality benefit to using this strategy, so it's very important. However, using lower tidal volumes means that the clinician must employ higher respiratory rates in order to achieve adequate minute ventilation, which is a respiratory rate times the tidal volume. Both low tidal volumes and tachypnea can be really uncomfortable and dyspneogenic for patients. And so this is part of the reason that patients often need substantial sedation when they're ventilated using a low tidal volumes ventilation strategy. Next up is appropriate PEEP. So PEEP is used to help keep alveoli open or recruited during mechanical ventilation. When alveoli open, shut, and reopen during every respiratory cycle, this causes cyclical trauma. To sort of imagine hands slapping together over and over again, and this can worsen lung injury also. Furthermore, in ARDS, when there's been a disruption of the alveolar capillary interface and loss of surfactant, the alveoli are hard to keep open due to increased surface tension. This causes increased shunting and worse hypoxemia, and that often prompts clinicians to increase the FiO2 and risk potential oxygen toxicity. However, applying positive end expiratory pressure, or PEEP, with a mechanical ventilator can address these issues. There are many strategies for setting and adjusting PEEP, 
The most commonly used one is based on the level of FiO2 that the patient is requiring to maintain an oxygen saturation between 88 and 95%. These are called the ARDSNET PEEP tables, and they can be used as a guide or as a starting point. Just remember your goal here is for an oxygen saturation of 88 to 95%, no higher. The next key management strategy is deliberate fluid management. So due to the leaky alveolar capillary interface after lung injury, patients with ARDS are subject to the accumulation of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. You can see here that in this drawing, the pulmonary edema is sort of seeping in from the, the pulmonary arteries into the interstitial space and filling up the alveolus. So for this reason, clinicians should be mindful of avoiding a positive fluid balance in patients with ARDS since this can worsen pulmonary edema. Diuretics or renal replacement therapy are often used to achieve this. And as commonly heard in the ICU, dry lungs are happy lungs. However, this must be considered in the context of the patient's hemodynamics and their renal status. Prone positioning. This has been best studied in patients with moderate to severe ARDS, meaning the P to F is less than 150, and there's a mortality benefit for prone positioning. So this is very, very important. Prone positioning has a number of physiologic benefits for the patient with ARDS. Firstly, the prone position relieves the lungs from the weight of the contents of the mediastinum. This improves blood flow and airflow, meaning VQ matching. As we've mentioned, ARDS lungs become full and heavy because of non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. This settles in the dependent portion of the lungs, worsening atelectasis and causing higher pressures in the dependent lung where there's also more lung tissue and the most blood flow. Flipping the patient into the prone position redistributes this fluid into the ventral lung where there's less lung tissue and allows a greater amount of lung tissue from the now dorsal lung to be recruited. These changes are not only important for the lung parenchyma, but also important for the right ventricle. When more lung is recruited, the resistance of the pulmonary vasculature decreases, and this lessens RV afterload. So prone positioning should be considered for patients who don't have a contraindication, but have a P to F less than 150, and should be considered early on in the course of ARDS, namely within 12 to 24 hours. Trials of prone positioning for ARDS have typically kept patients in the prone position between six and 18 hours with breaks in the supine position and then resumption of the prone position. This is often carried out until the patient is convincingly improving or has failed. And clinicians should look for an improvement in the P to F or the compliance for a given tidal volume. So let's recap what we've discussed so far in video one. We started by identifying the criteria used to diagnose ARDS, namely the Berlin criteria. We then moved on to the four key components of ARDS care, low tidal volume ventilation, PEEP titration, deliberate fluid management, and prone positioning. So that's it for video number one. Watch the next video for a continued discussion about management strategies for COVID-19 associated ARDS, as well as important care for your ICU patients.